Hello and welcome. And today I'm here to present on dizziness. Um, next month I'll have another presentation that'll be on May 9th. Um, and that one will be on mental health awareness since May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So this presentation is entitled Kicking Dizziness to the Curb. We're going to talk about um, vertigo and dizziness and potential causes, symptoms, and some treatment options. And I'll also give you some education and some demonstration on exercises effective in combating vertigo and dizziness. So dizziness in general is a false sense of motion. It's associated with increased fear of falling, functional disability, and depressive symptoms. Although the cause of dizziness isn't always found, symptoms can be treated. So let's talk about some statistics. 50% of older adults 85 years and older complain of dizziness have complained of dizziness over the past month. The number one most common complaint for those over 75 years of age is dizziness. 18% of those 65 and older reported diminished activity due to dizziness, which also increases by age. 30% of adults 60 and older complain of dizziness over the last month, and only 2% of patients seen by doctors referred for autologic diagnoses or inner ear issues. Um, and then uh, dizziness and vertigo are also more common in women than in men. So I know this is a little small, but um, it basically just shows us that vertigo is the number one cause of dizziness. And that's based on um, some studies that looked at um, the causes of dizziness in different clinical settings. Um, so we have primary care, a dizziness clinic in two cases, and then also an emergency room. And for all of those, um, the most common cause was vertigo. Okay, so now if we look at different categories of dizziness, so we just talked about vertigo, um, but how are we quantify? How are we qualifying um, symptoms of vertigo? Okay, so symptoms and potential causes include a false sense of motion, possible spinning sensation, and the causes um, relate to the inner ear. So an imbalanced vestibular system from the inner or middle ear or brain, the way those systems talk to each other is affected with vertigo. And the percentage of dizziness that fits into that vertigo diagnosis is 45 uh, to 54%. Then if we look at the next category, it's disequilibrium. Um, so what we mean when we say dis disequilibrium is that the patient feels off balance or wobbly, as opposed to uh, with vertigo, that sense of moving or spinning. Um, and it's perceived as your body being off balance or wobbly as opposed to your head giving you the, that feeling. Um, and the percentage of people with dizziness that it's categorized as disequilibrium is up to 16%. And then we have presyncope. So that's a feeling of losing consciousness or passing out or fainting. Um, so, you know, a lot of times people will describe like um, their vision kind of starts to close in. They see dark around the edges. Um, or their vision starts to get fuzzy in general, and they feel like they're going to lose consciousness or pass out. Um, and this is usually due to a decreased cerebral blood flow, um, and it can be due to a cardiac cause from the heart or a vascular cause um, from some change in the vasculature, okay? And the percentage there is up to 14%. And then lightheadedness is the last category on this slide. So lightheadedness is the hardest one to describe, um, but it's also the hardest one to categorize. And so I wonder if that doesn't play into it only being about 10% of um, cases of dizziness categorized as lightheadedness. Um, some people say it feels like floating or um, like they're just not perceiving their world the way they usually do. Like, 
things are kind of altered, but um, it, is, it is vague and hard to describe. Um, and it can be related to anxiety um, or other psychological issues. Okay, so let's talk more in depth about vertigo. So this type of dizziness is felt as a false sense of motion. So either the room or you, something is, is moving in a way uh, in your mind that it, you know it's not moving actually physically. So the feeling of spinning is, most, is the most common sensation that's reported. Severe cases could result in nausea and vomiting. And the most common causes of dizziness with vertigo include BPPV, or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, and labyrinthitis. Okay, so if we talk about BPPV, um, it's most commonly recognized cause of vertigo, um, and it's caused by calcium debris that becomes loose within the inner ear canals. When that moves around, it changes our perception of, um, of that balance, which causes those symptoms. Uh, so it's precipitated by movement or position changes in the head, um, and the dizziness from it is often quite brief, usually seconds, and rarely it can get up to minutes. But BPPV usually is recurring over months or weeks, so sometimes if we get it cleared, it can come back. Once you have it, you're more predisposed to get it again. The next condition is Meniere's disease. Um, so this is an inner ear disease causing vertigo, um, sometimes ringing in the ears or tinnitus, hearing loss, and congestion in the ear. Um, we can have episodes of dizziness with this that can vary by case, but attacks are usually sudden. They come on quickly. Um, severe cases can result in falls due to that dizziness that can be debilitating. And it's caused by a buildup of excess fluid called endolymph in that inner ear. So this accumulation happens um, in the inner ear section and the fluid builds up and disrupts the balance and hearing by clogging the nerve transmission from the ear to the brain. Um, so because our inner ear is so related with balance um, and obviously with hearing, um, it communicates directly with the brain to, to coordinate those things. Um, when that fluid balance is off, it really changes the way we perceive those things. The next one is vestibular neuritis. Um, so anytime we see an itis on the end of something, that's an inflammation, right? So um, this is then just what it sounds like if you break it down. Um, a, an inflammation of the vestibular nerve, okay? So, um, and that's located in the inner ear. And this nerve transmits balance signals from the ear to the brain. So inflammation in this nerve causes vertigo, but it rarely causes pain um, because that nerve's job is just to transmit those balance uh, signals. Research shows that the cause is viral in nature, usually following a viral illness. So we know viruses can affect different parts of the body differently, um, and some viruses uh, you know, like to go to different parts versus others. Um, but obviously, if we have, um, you know, a virus that attacks more of like that upper respiratory system and that's very close, uh, you know, to our inner ear, uh, that could be something that can potentially lead to this condition. Um, it makes up only 15% of all vertigo cases, um, and it's usually seen in younger population, 20 to 50 years old. Okay, so now labyrinthitis. So we've got another itis here, okay? So labyrinthitis is a result of inflammation of the labyrinth located in the inner ear. Um, the lab labyrinth are fluid-filled sacs and tubes, and they provide the body with information about balance and sound. When one of these systems becomes inflamed, loss of hearing and vertigo could uh, result. Normally, it occurs in only one ear, and the condition is very rare, okay? So um, this is something that we could see, but it's not as common as the other causes. Okay, Dis disequilibrium. 
is basically just a feeling of unsteadiness or um, a loss of balance or a loss of your equilibrium, your sense of balance, right? So it results in spatial disorientation. Um, and you can sometimes experience some spinning sensation with it, um, but not always. And 85% of people experiencing disequilibrium will have difficulty walking safely and steadily. Um, geriatric disequilibrium disorders can be caused by one or more factors, including vestibular, vascular, visual, neuromuscular, and pharmacological. And sometimes those things all interact to give us that perfect storm, right? And then if we talk about presyncope, again, that's, that's where that feeling of um, lightheadedness to the point where we think we might pass out, okay? So the feeling that one is going to pass out, um, but without actually having that loss of consciousness. It can last for seconds to minutes, and um, the causes can be diverse, ranging from cardiac to non-cardiac. Some cardiac causes um, can be associated also with palpitations of the heart. And then non-cardiac, we can also see orthostatic hypotension, so where that blood pressure drops um, specifically with a change in movement. And then medication-induced or um, a vasovagal response. So a vasovagal response is the most common cause of presyncope with feelings of nausea, flushing, sweating, blurry vision, lightheadedness, and dizziness. And it's not fun if you've ever experienced it. I'm sure probably a lot of you have um, at one time or another. But you can also tell how it does feel different um, from other dizziness that you might have um, encountered. Uh, kind of has its own, its own different feeling. That feeling like you're going to pass out, that really is um, unique to uh, presyncope. And then we have lightheadedness the hardest one to describe and the most vague one, right? So it's often like a heavy feeling in your head, like it's not getting enough blood supply. Um, it's unfortunately a very common feeling in many older adults, um, and it can be caused by lots of different things. So 40% of older adults have lightheadedness enough to see a doctor about it. Um, it's often also mentioned, you know, when you see a doctor or it's in those, um, you know, questionnaires that you check off when you go to a doctor's office. And sometimes when you see it, you're like, oh, yeah, well, I've had that before. And, and we check it off, right? Um, the most common causes are positional changes, medication changes, low blood volume or dehydration, um, illness, anxiety, and stress. So lots of things can bring that on if we're not taking care of ourselves. Now we want to talk about some treatment approaches. What do we do about this dizziness? And it is dependent on what's causing it and what the symptoms are. So um, dizziness and vertigo are a result of very different disease processes. And treatment approaches um, are going to be quite different. We always want to consult our medical doctor first. Um, they are the first person to talk to you about um, these medical symptoms. Um, we always talk to them about the symptoms of dizziness and vertigo, especially if they're disrupting our daily function and they're debil debilitating to our daily life. Then your physical, occupational, and speech therapists um, are effective in the treatment of vertigo and related impairments, and we can also help to figure out um, you know, exactly what's going on and then what to do about it. So speaking with our staff is the best way to find out how we can help. All right, so let's look at that BPPV treatment for this. So um, the treatment that we want to do for it is what's called an Epley maneuver. So if we're looking at the cause, right, it's in that inner ear. It's caused by dis misplaced or displaced particles positioned in the inner ear, and a maneuver is required to clear those particles out and um, get them back to a space where they're not going to be interfering uh, with our balance and potentially our hearing. Um, so we want to clear those loose particles. We'll, they're also called autolith um, from the inner ear, and that will provide immediate relief of vertigo in true cases of BPPV. Um, that's not to say it won't recur a little bit and 
immediate could be a bit of a stretch because sometimes there's more than one and we don't always get them all where they need to go with the first time we do the procedure. Um, so this maneuver is designed to first be performed by a licensed therapist or physician, and then it can be taught to a resident or their caregiver. Um, it's a little bit more effective um, when a practitioner does it, especially that first time, um, because we've, we've been trained in it and we've done it before, right? But I do um, have handouts that can show you how to do it yourself, um, and it can be it can be guided. There's also we live in the age of um, YouTube, right? So there's plenty of YouTube videos that can walk you through um, doing the procedure. So after the positioning is complete, the patient should not lie flat, jerk the head, um, and sleep at a position of about 30 degrees of incline for about two days. And that's so that those auto lifts don't go right back where they were, right? We've got to keep them out of that spot where they um, should not be. Um, and we want to discontinue doing that maneuver um, and, and following those precautions um, once you've had no vertigo for 24 hours after um, the maneuver being performed. Okay, but sometimes it takes, and oftentimes, it takes more than one time of doing that maneuver to get everything cleared um, to where we need it to be. So I know this does say it gives you immediate relief um, in true cases of BPPV, and that's accurate, but we don't always get it all the first time. Okay, so what is this Epley's maneuver? Um, so it's going to sh show you here on the slide um, what you would do for that left ear being affected or that right ear being affected. Um, and if you look closely, you can see that they're mirror images of each other. Um, so this is something that's much easier to show you um, than to just look at a diagram and see. So I would encourage anybody who does have um, some dizziness that they think might be related to a BPPV um, to seek out your physician or um, therapy. And uh, if you need help getting a prescription for therapy, I can help you with the process of all of that. Um, but the easiest way to do it is really to have somebody uh, put you through it the first time, okay? So this says there's a 70% success rate on the first attempt and nearly 100% on successive maneuvers if it truly is BPPV. But as we talked about all those different causes of dizziness and vertigo, um, we don't always know until we try this maneuver a couple times if we're truly looking at a case of BPPV. So let's talk about vestibular rehabilitation. So we just talked about that Epley that's specific to BPPV. Um, Although the cause of dizziness isn't always found, symptoms can be treated even if we don't know specifically what's causing it. So when we look at vestibular rehabilitation, we're improving the balance and reducing problems associated with dizziness. We're also looking at improving leg strength and flexibility, and we wanna challenge the body's balance system to strengthen its neurological responses. So there are lots of different tools that we can use to um, improve that gait training and modifications to assistive devices. If someone's more dizzy, they're going to need more um, assistance from an assistive device. So we may have to change that up um, in the short term when we're trying to treat that um, dizziness and, and aid in that balance. Visual stability training. So that's specific exercises um, that we would do. And then education on vertigo and balance training, how to fall to limit injury, Treatments, modification, and education after hearing loss, and home modifications. So those are all things that can be done um, by a therapist to help you during vestibular rehabilitation. Okay, so now we're going to talk about habituation therapy. So this is some specific exercise that we might do. Um, habituation exercises reduce dizziness through repeated exposure to the movements that provoke dizziness. Well, you're probably saying if it makes me dizzy, I just shouldn't do it, right? 
Under normal circumstances, yes, because um, I wouldn't want you to do something that made you dizzy, you know, while you were walking or in, in a situation where it would put you at risk for falling. But when we're specifically talking about these exercises, if we can put you into that position or um, whatever it is that's provoking that dizziness and habituate your system to that position, then we can have less dizziness over time from that provoking position. Um, so these exercises provoke the episodes so that over time, intensity of dizziness and vertigo diminish as the brain begins to accommodate to the abnormal signs from the inner ear. So those abnormal signs might still be present, but your brain isn't responding in the same way to them. It's not overreacting to them, um, causing the issue that we have. So um, some examples of that, a lot of times um, people moving the head up and down um, can bring on that dizziness or side to side um, or rolling in bed. Uh, those are just some examples. So sometimes if I have somebody that, um, that gets dizzy with movement um, and I'll have them walk and do head side to side, that's to get that system used to, okay, I'm getting weird signals when I go side to side, but if I get my brain used to it, then it will respond better for me so I won't feel as dizzy. And then gaze stabilization therapy. So um, dizziness and vertigo are often made worse by disruption of our visual field, especially when the head is moving or when walking and looking. So this is then taking this, um, taking the same ideas as the habituation and um, focusing just on the visual part of it, okay? So people often report that their visual fields jump around or bounce. Two gaze stabilization exercises can be performed. Um, we wanna either stare at a fixed object while we move our head, okay? Or we wanna follow a moving object while our head stays still, right? That's our first, first phase of it. Then we move to following a moving object while you're moving as well, right? Added challenge, okay? Um, so these are specific type of habituation exercises of the visual field, which improves those visual disruptions. And then balance therapy, which can look like a lot of things, right? There's a lot of exercises and um, things that we can do to improve the balance. Um, so we wanna improve the balance and steadiness so that the daily activities um, can be performed more successfully. Um, and we wanna reduce environmental barriers and we wanna reduce fall risk. Uh, exercises can focus on visual training, stationary and dynamic movements, and multitask training. So doing more than one thing at once so that we can uh, make sure our focus stays in the right place. And then therapy focuses on tasks that are important in your life. Um, with the individual focus of your goals. So um, if it's not important to you to get back to a certain thing, you know, that wouldn't be a focus for us. Um, so here are some things that we can do if we still feel dizzy, but um, I want to take a little step back and talk about, okay, so why are we, why are we focusing on balance and dizziness and, and what does this all have to do together? Okay, so our balance um, comes from three separate systems. So the first that we've talked a lot about today is that inner ear. So that inner ear talks to our brain and tells us, okay, this is where we are in space. And as we've talked about with that dizziness, we're often getting um, incorrect or exaggerated or sometimes, yeah, just wrong signals from that inner ear telling the brain where we are and, um, and how we should be adapting to that. Um, but apart from the, the vestibular system, the inner ear, there's also uh, your visual system. So we talked about that a little bit with gaze stabilization. Um, your visual system also gives you a lot of input um, for your balance. And then the third system um, is your somatosensory system. So that's those nerves, um, specifically because we walk on our feet and our legs and our feet, um, that tell our brain where we are in space as um, in terms of our feet on the floor um, 
And so that is something that we can also work on in therapy. So all three of those systems can be challenged with exercises that we work on in therapy. Okay, so what if we still feel dizzy? <laughs> As we've talked about, dizziness is the number one complaint of those 75 years and older. The good news is that dizziness and vertigo is often treated and often resolved if we seek treatment for it. Although it's common, dizziness is not normal and should be immediately addressed, especially if it's worsening. It's rarely life-threatening, um, but it will disrupt healthy and active daily function. You know, as you can tell, if, if you don't feel like you're perceiving things quite right, um, it can definitely make it difficult for you to be getting out and about. If you feel dizzy more than once daily, you need to tell someone. Your doctor should be the first person, um, but I could also help with that. Okay, so therapy can help to calm dizziness and to get you feeling better. With education, exercises, vital sign monitoring, and environmental modifications, life can return back to normal in no time. So dizziness is a common issue for older adults. Finding the cause of dizziness will take professional guidance. Physical, occupational, and speech therapists are equipped to identify causes, tailor solutions, and implement programs to take dizziness to the curb. Um, I have handouts that provide a quick guide to definitions and general causes. Um, never hesitate to mention your feelings of dizziness to your medical providers. Miss Lizzie, you no longer need to feel dizzy. All right. Thank you so much for watching this um, and look for my upcoming monthly presentations. Thank you.